The reason that our problems often go unresolved is because you and I try to resolve them too quickly. We want it to be resolved overnight. That is not how the living God works. The living God works on his timeline. He is patient. He knows what he is doing with your son, with your daughter. He's knowing what he's doing with your spouse, with your place of work. He knows what he is doing with all of that, but you, follower of Jesus, must listen to him. We're going to jump into the Gospel of Matthew, so if you'd like to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1, you can. You can power on your phone. The the, uh, passages will also be on the monitors to my right and left. And this is the story of the birth of Jesus. And if you've ever spent any time in church traditions, Methodist, Baptist, Anglican, it doesn't really matter. You've probably heard the Christmas story at some point. And it's typically including sound bites like the Virgin Mary or the Christ child or, or something like that. But this morning, I'm hoping that you can learn the Christmas story from Joseph's perspective. Like, oh, what does Joseph have to do with the Christmas story? Well, a lot more than meets the eye. And so as we jump into the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew's tradition, we're going to look at the story from Joseph's perspective or being in Joseph's shoes because it's really likely because of Jewish uh, and Hebrew heritage that if Mary was a virgin, it was also very likely that Joseph was too. So now the Christmas story is the Virgin Mary and the Virgin Joseph. Kind of an odd way to start Christmas, right? But it's really, really important. Really important. So let's open up the passage together and we'll dive right in. This is Matthew chapter 1. We're going to skip all of the genealogies (laughs) for your sake and for my sake and for time's sake. And we're going to zero in on verse 18 and it says this. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Okay, let's pause there. Let's consider this reality of Joseph's. It was likely that he was in his late teens or early 20s. That's typically when a Jewish couple would uh, consummate their marriage in Bible days. So he could have been anywhere from 17, even 16, up to 21, 22, somewhere in that uh, age, age range. And it was very likely, if not completely assumed, that he also was a virgin. This is very important because if you were to talk to any 17-year-old boy ever, they're looking forward to one thing in life, their honeymoon, Okay. And so that is what is on Joseph's mind. Keep in mind that, okay? He's got all of these hopes, all of these dreams, and all of these expectations for this new life with his fiance, Mary. It's really likely that they had talked about the life that they wanted together. What vision did they have for their lives? Were they going to move? Did they want a big family, a small family? What was in their heart of hearts? How did they want to apply their gifts and talents to the kingdom of God all those years ago? What was in their mind's eye? I can tell you, Joseph and Mary had a vision for their life. It maybe doesn't crystallize it in the passage here, but they were human, so they had high expectations for what was coming. If if they were teenagers or even in their early 20s, most of their dreams hadn't been realized yet. So we're talking about a young married couple or an engaged couple who had all this dream, all this vision, all these expectations for their lives. If I was Joseph, I I couldn't wait to marry Mary. She was always on my mind, and I was always thinking about her, and and, and I couldn't wait for the, the, the final signing of the papers was signed. We are now married, and we can consummate this marriage. And then all of those hopes and all of those dreams and all of those expectations began to quickly fade when he discovered that not only his, was his fiance pregnant, but his fiance was claiming that she was pregnant 
from the Holy Spirit. And so now he's like, oh my gosh, my fiance is way crazier than her Facebook profile let me on to believe. All my hopes, all my dreams, all my expectations, gone. And my fiance's nuts. This is the story of Christmas from Joseph's perspective. He had a real problem on his hands, did he not? He had a very large problem on his hands. At least he was mature enough and enough of a man to not take the drama of his life and create a spectacle out of his fiance. It says that he intended to what? Divorce her quietly, and he was completely within his rights to do so. But there's more to the story, isn't there? I wonder if sometimes the way of Jesus can get us into this rut of thinking that the problem in front of us is the end of the story. You see, Joseph's scope of vision was limited to his current reality. He didn't see pre-Mary and Joseph or post-Mary and Joseph. He just saw Mary's pregnant and that kid's not mine. This is a huge problem at hand. What do I do? Well, I'm at least enough of a man to not turn this into a reality TV show. I will divorce her quietly. There is nothing more disappointing than expectations of your life not being met. There's nothing more painful than all of the hopes and dreams that you had for your life, for your family, for your children to ultimately become unfulfilled and fade into the background. There's nothing more disappointing than having this beautiful vision for your life be canceled by something out of your control. If you were Joseph, what would you do? Because if I was Joseph, my limited scope of vision would look at my current reality and say, I intend to divorce her quietly. Because that's what humans do with their limited scope of vision. Many years ago, my grandfather, who I called Papa, does anyone here have a grandfather that they called Papa? It's a pretty common title. He's been in heaven for many years now. But when I was a child, I remember going to Papa's basement, and Papa had a lot of interests. He was a gardener. He loved to camp. And mostly, he loved to work with wood. He was a wood uh, he was a carpenter, and he had a wood shop in his basement. And so I would go to his basement when I was a child. I remember smelling the sawdust in the air as it floated underneath the lights. Can you relate? Can you see it in your mind's eye? Can you smell the sawdust? I remember loving those moments as I was four, five, six, nine years old. I would go to the basement, and I would play in the basement, and then I would look in his wood shop, and I'd, I'd smell the sawdust. I'd smell the fresh cut wood. I'd see the dust in the air, and then I'd kind of creep in and there's this big wood shop in Papa's basement. Now what would be vintage shop tools lined this whole wall. And there was this big box next to all those shop tools with a lot of raw material in it. All kinds of scrap wood from pre-projects unfinished or scrap wood that he had picked up from a construction site, or just leftover lumber in general. He had a, a collection box, a receptacle for the raw material, the scrap wood. And I always remembered thinking as I went up to the scrap wood, how does he do anything with this? How does he create anything beautiful or delightful with all this raw material, with all this scrap wood? Now, every holiday, Papa would make myself and my older brothers and my cousins something from his wood shop. And around Halloween, he would make us a little pumpkin. And sometimes he would get around to painting it. I think we still have that pumpkin somewhere stored. I think I can re recall that Thanksgiving, we got like a profile, wooden profile of a turkey. And most importantly, I remember at Christmas, there would be a profile face of a Santa maybe painted, but my favorite was the reindeer that was also a 3D puzzle. It was really cool. We still have it. And he would take all this raw material, and spend all this time creating something beautiful 
and good and delightful out of it that blessed me and my brothers. And we still have those little heirlooms to look back at today. Like Papa, God looks at the raw material of your life and doesn't see the problem. He sees his unfinished plans. And right now, many of you are looking at the raw material of your life and your limited scope of vision just sees the problem. You, like Joseph, see your problem. This is a big problem. My fiance is pregnant and it's not my child. What is your principal problem in life right now? What is the thing that's taking up the majority of your emotion and, and, and mind? What is the thing that's overwhelming you to the point of losing sleep? This problem we look at with our limited scope of vision and come to the conclusion that, well, I intend to divorce her quietly. I intend to take control of this because I don't see anything before the problem and I see certainly nothing after the problem. I just see the problem. When I looked at that box of raw material, I saw raw material. I saw unfinished work. And God does not look at your problem the way that you look at your problem. God's looking at your problem saying, hey, that's unfinished work. That's unfulfilled promises. That's unfinished work work. You serve and believe and sing to a God who takes raw material and turns it into pumpkins and turkeys and reindeers. Just like my granddad did, taking something unfinished and creating a great result and product out of it that will bless your life. But you must increase your scope of vision. It took an angel sent by God to Joseph in a dream to convince him of this reality. Look at what the passage says here. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Now he's going to start thinking he's crazy. Verse 21, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save the people, his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. Verse 23, quote, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Matthew briefly allows the reader to take a peek into the shop room, into the wood shop room of God to understand how God might fulfill the promise in his word. And so what does Matthew do? He quotes the angel who's quoting a prophet in the Old Testament. And that prophet is Isaiah 4, 7, 14. And it says this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Here's what's critical to understand about this scene is that Isaiah prophesied those words 700 years before the Christ child's birth. God, the great shopkeeper, the great carpenter, will make a hundred or a thousand or a hundred thousand cuts on raw material before there is a final product. Do you follow me this morning? Each of you have a problem in your life right now that you have a limited scope of vision on. You see the problem, and the problem is there. But there's all this stuff that's happening before the problem came about to be a problem. And there's all this stuff that will happen after the problem to fulfill a promise. You must believe that God knows what he's doing with the raw material of your life. And there is a box of raw material in every one of our lives, isn't there? So what did Joseph do? Look at verse 24. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, which is an amazing amount of self-control. And he gave him the name Jesus. 
I want you to put yourselves in Joseph's shoes for a second. The amount of emotions and feelings of disappointment, perhaps even betrayal. The thoughts and the fears of all of my dreams aren't going to come true. All of these expectations on my life, they're not going to happen now. This was supposed to go this way, and now it's going this way. What is happening? I would be frustrated. I would be depressed. I'd be full of anxiety. I'd be mad at God. I'd be full of all the feelings. All the feels would be there. A couple years ago, I can recall my wife and I were going to bed we just put our, at the time, our one child down and she was in bed and we're like, oh, praise God. So let's go get a snack in the kitchen. And so we were having a snack in the kitchen and we were listening to some music and then we had our snack. We're like, let's go to bed. Hit pause on my phone. Let's go to bed. So we went over and we got into bed and, and sometimes we're really good at evening devotionals and then sometimes we just, you know, go straight to bed and sometimes we check email and sometimes I jump on YouTube for whatever, right? Because I'm human too. And so that night I opened up YouTube and I was wa watching this little ditty and all of a sudden my wife and I were like, whoa, do you hear a voice in the kitchen? Yeah, you better go check that out. So I quick hit pause on my phone. I'm like, king of my castle, right? Go out there. I'm like, who's in my house? Who's in my house? And, uh, nobody. Nobody's in my house. Doors are locked. Everything's safe. I go back to the bedroom. Honey, I, there's nothing out there. There's no one out there. I don't know what that sound was. I don't know what it was. Well, okay, we'll just, you know, Everyone's kind of amped up right now. So I went back to bed, tried to calm down. I didn't finish my YouTube video, so I got my phone, hit play. Well, there was the voice again. Oh, my phone was still Bluetooth connected to the speaker in the kitchen. <laughs> but I had a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, and I was ready to fight, right? What's the point of that little funny story? that your feelings are true, but they rarely tell the whole truth. Your feelings about the principal problem in your life right now are true, but are they telling the whole story? Are they telling the whole truth or just your limited scope of vision? You can see the problem, and it's creating all kinds of feelings in your world, and those feelings are true, but they rarely tell the whole truth. So what's the one thing Joseph did right? The one thing Joseph did right is that he listened to God. He very well could have just ignored the Spirit of God altogether, you remember, he was the disappointed one whose dreams and expectations got uh, deleted and canceled. If I was Joseph, and like, everyone just get away from me. I'm too frustrated right now. Everything that I hoped and dreamed for is not going to happen now because of my current problem in front of me. And so if I was Joseph, I'd be feeling all these feelings, but then the angel of God shows up to me in a dream and says, this is the rest of this story. And Joseph could have been like, no, nah. no, it's not. I ain't going to believe you. I'm not trusting this again. No, I've been disappointed one too many times. I'm frustrated. I don't need this. I just need to back out of here. I'm going to go do my own thing. Do my own thing. But he didn't do that, did he? No. Joseph listened to God. He listened to God. And at the end of the day, you and I can choose as to whether or not we will listen to the almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving God in our lives. Or we will look at our problem with a limited scope of vision and say, no, nope, I'm too, I'm too disappointed. You stay out of this, God. I don't believe you. I don't trust you. I've been disappointed one too many times now. And you could do that. But Joseph didn't do that. What's the rest of the story? As we look at Joseph, we see ourselves. We see our problems. We see what's going on in our lives that need to be resolved. 
And I got, I got to thinking about my own life, and I got to, be, got to thinking about your life. Lord, what's happening in the lives of the people of Mercy Road? What's happening in the lives of the people of, of this city? And you've probably got a problem. You might be in debt, which is a problem. And it probably doesn't feel good at all to be in debt. But if you listen to what the Spirit of God is saying to your life on the topic of your debt, it can become God's unfinished plans and work in your life. But you will stay in debt. You will stay in that hole of frustration until you listen to God. Because God's raw material, the raw material of your life becomes God's unfinished plans. He can take the scraps from that box of wood and he can create something beautiful and good out of it. But you, like Joseph, must listen to him. Are you lonely? That's a problem. It probably doesn't feel good, does it? Are you listening to the voice of God in your life? Because it can become God's unfinished plans of connecting and triaging you to the right people, to great people. But you must listen to God. You must listen to Him. Are you and someone you love on non-talking terms? Nothing like the holidays to exasperate that issue. That's a problem, and it doesn't feel good. But by God's grace, he can take your problem, and he can look at it and be like, that's my unfinished plan. And he can create the reconciliation and the forgiveness out of that raw material, out of that problem, but you must listen to God. He is not going to force an unfinished plan on your life. He is offering it to you because he loves you because he wants to create the pumpkin and the turkey and the 3D reindeer and give it to you as a gift because he loves you. Church family, what is the raw material currently in your life? Only you can answer that. What is the principal problem in your life right now? Only you can answer that. But... God can take that raw material and take that problem and repackage it, repurpose it, reorient it, and create some beautiful results with it if you listen to him. Chapter 2 says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the, king of time of, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied. For this is what the prophet has written. Quote, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Matthew, again, takes a prophecy from the Old Testament, this time Micah 5.2, and uses it as proof of concept that God takes these problems, subjects them to some kind of process to ultimately fulfill the promise. You must understand that Micah was also seven hundred years before the Christ child. 700 years. The reason that our problems often go unresolved is because you and I try to resolve them too quickly. We want it to be resolved overnight. That is not how the living God works. The living God works on his timeline. He is patient he knows what he is doing with your son, with your daughter. He's knowing what he's doing with your spouse, with your place of work. He knows what he is doing with all of that. But you, follower of Jesus, must listen to him. Sure, at face value, from the outside looking in, Joseph and Mary had a real big problem on their hands. But the problem was, did what? It cued the process, and the process did what? Fulfilled 
the promise. Look at the entire counsel of God. The Christ child was promised by two different prophets 700 years before the Christ child was born in a no-name town. And so Matthew takes these prophecies and reminds the the listeners, the readers who are in their Hebrew reality in in the Bible days, like, "Oh, oh, that's right. Micah and Isaiah both have promised that this Christ child would be born, and we thought that he would be born in this big spectacle, Thanksgiving Day parade style deal. But but that's right, they were talking about Bethlehem in Micah 5 too. Do you remember where Bethlehem is? I can't recall now. It's just too small of a no-name town. I don't know where it is. And that's where the Christ child was born. You see, the very problem that Joseph and Mary had in their lives was part of God's process to fulfill a promise that he gave Israel 700 years prior. This means that you can reframe reframe every single problem in your life. You can no longer look at your problem with a limited scope of vision and saying, I have to resolve my problem right now, you can actually reframe it all together and say, this is part of God's process to fulfill God's promise, but I must listen to him. Joseph could have been like, nope. No thanks. Been there, done that. Not going there again. May you have the courage of Joseph today and listen to the spirit of the living God so that your life and all of the problems of your life can be reframed with a new perspective and now you can see how God is taking every problem that you and I experience, subjecting it to his process to fulfill a promise unfulfilled. But will you listen to him? Or will you try to control the outcome of the problem in your life? Or will you give it to him and listen to what he has to say about it? Verse 7 says, Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They saw, they, then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Church family, your problems are optional. You can choose to perceive the problem of your life as part of God's process to fulfill a promise on your life. You must increase your scope of vision and understand the way God works in his kids' lives. You can choose to listen to God as he speaks to you about the primary issue and problem in your life. But you must listen to them. And if you don't, those problems are liable to become unfinished. Because God wants your obedience. He wants your ear. It reminds me of the promise of Romans 8.28. And we know that in what? All things. Not just good things. Not just convenient things, but in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. If you love God, will you listen to him too? You must, like Joseph, bend your ear and tune it to the spirit of the living God's voice in your life. Luke, how do I listen to God's voice? How do I hear him? 
I want to be like Joseph. I want to hear what he has to say about the principal problem in my life. Because I think I believe God's word. God can take my problem, subject it to a process, and use it to fulfill a promise, unfulfilled. But you must listen to him. How do you listen to God? Well, all through the counsel of God, there's really three primary ways. The prophetic counsel of those around you, the prophetic word of God, and in time of intentional prophetic prayer. All throughout Scripture, those are the three primary ways God speaks to his followers. And so you must get around good people who will speak over your life, who will speak into your life. There's a proverb that says, in the collection of counsel, plans succeed. Who is counseling right, you right now? Is it your social media algorithms? That's really bad counsel. But if you can get around good christ Loving, Christ-centered, biblically founded, anchored believers and subject and submit yourself to their counsel. You just might hear the voice of God in your life. If you open up God's word, the prophetic word, all throughout the entire counsel of God is God speaking over his humans, over his people. You want to hear God's voice? Read God's words. You must open God's word. You must get around God's people. And then finally, the prophetic prayer. You must allow yourself to be prayed for, and you must find yourself in prayer. Whether it is on your knees, or whether it is asking someone to come around you and place hands on you, if you want to hear the voice of God in your life regularly, any of those three things, you can and will Hear the voice of God in your life. But even then, it doesn't mean that you will have the courage to listen to what he's saying to you. Do you have the courage of Joseph this Christmas to look at your problem, increase your scope of vision, and say, Lord, all I can see is my problem. All I can see is my box of raw material. But somehow you see it as unfinished plans. And you can choose to believe that. And you can choose to listen to what he has to say about it. It was in the peak of COVID, which disrupted everyone's lives. I believe it was the end of 2020. I can't remember exactly the month. But my wife has been a mental health provider most of her adult life. That's her, that's her career. She's a tremendous mental health provider. I'm, I respect her for that for so many reasons. She's been so successful in that, in that regard. But there was a point in the peak of COVID where her group that she was on staff with uh, sent out the memo, hey, officing here is not an option. Everything has gone virtual, which is pretty consistent with the, the peak of, of the COVID drama that happened to a lot of companies. So even though she was able to retain the majority of her clients as a mental health provider, a session in room and a session virtual are two very different experiences. And I can recall some of the angst and frustration, even though there was a little bit of convenience to it, but just the angst and frustration that the clients might have or that she as a health provider might have had. And she did that like the most of us did that for months on end and months and then, you know, maybe even a year or more. And there was at one point, I remember my wife communicating to me. She goes, Luke, I, I just in prayer and, and, and reading God's word, believe that God is saying to me a real simple, clear message that I don't know what to do with. Luke, he is saying to me, Ashley, you won't return to the office. And I don't know what to do with that. Luke, I don't, I don't know what to do with this because I love what I do. I love being a mental health provider. I love serving people. I love helping people get over, you know, the hurdle of, of their life or whatever. But God said to me that I'm not going back to the office. What does that mean? What does that mean? So months went by and we continued, continued to hold that before the Lord and said, Lord, I don't know why you prophetically spoke this into my wife's life, but we believe that's from you. So what does this mean? 
Because then she eventually got the email from her group practice that, hey, now officing is available again, but you can choose how you orient your schedule, be it virtual or virtual and in person or mixed, or it's totally up to you. So she gets this email that the office is now open again, but she's got this word from the Lord that you will never return to the office. And she was like, what, what is God trying to do? What is, what is he doing? It, and then almost like overnight, it clicked for her. You see, in my wife's whole life, she had a vision, just like Joseph. She had expectation, just like Joseph. She had dream, just like Joseph, of launching her own private practice. And so you know what she did? She didn't go back to the office. She opened up her own. And through the process of having someone build her a website and doing some marketing and finding some, some space here in the part of town, her client load not only was taken care of, but it doubled in just a few weeks. You see, she saw the principal problem in her life of God is saying, I'm not going back to the office, but I've got my email from my boss saying the office is now open again and I'm caught in the middle and many of you are caught in the middle of hearing God's voice and obeying it. And so she did. She chose to listen to the spirit of the living God's voice. And she opened up her own practice. She's been doing that for some time now. And I'm so proud of her for that. She sees so many more clients and helps so many more people in mental health now than ever before. You can choose to listen to the spirit of the living God's voice. And your problems can be part of God's process. And the process will fulfill the promise. But you must believe that deep down. You must believe that every problem that you face can be subject to the process of God, to the woodworking shop of God, because he knows what he's doing. He can turn the raw material of your life into something beautiful and delightful and finished. And I know that's what you want. I know deep down each one of you want the dreams and hopes and expectations of your life to be met. And they can be met on God's timing, by God's power, in God's will, but he's not going to do it and force it without your involvement. You must listen to him. So I don't know if there's someone in the room this morning who had an expectation for their life or a hope or a dream for their life that they would know God. That invitation is for you this morning, friend. There is an all-knowing, all-loving, mighty God who wants a relationship with you. And you can choose to listen to that truth and respond to him, or you can choose to let it slide away. But I want you to know that the almighty God of the universe, Jesus himself, died for you on a cross, a criminal's death or a gruesome death, proving that he was human. And then went to the grave for three days and then resurrecting out of that grave three days later, proving that he was God. You can't find Jesus' bones anywhere because he's at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And he loves you and he's offering himself to you. Is the spirit of the living God offering salvation to your soul today, friend? Offering reconciliation to your heart today, brother or sister in the Lord? Take him up on that offer. Listen to him. This doesn't have to be a church service that you've checked the box off with. This can be an entirely new chapter of your life. And perhaps you've been walking with the Lord for many years and you've got a lot of unmet expectations, a lot of problems. You've got a lot of raw material in your life that you don't know what to do with. Increase your scope of vision. Give it before the Lord. Ask him to use it as a process to fulfill his promise. He will. God is a promise keeper. He's not a disappointer. So I don't know where you are on that spectrum, but you do. So why don't you take some time and be with the Lord in that conversation today? Be it in time of worship or be it in the prayer room. We are ready. They are ready. The Spirit of the living God is ready to work with you. God in heaven, each one of us have a problem in our lives right now. 
where all we can see is the problem. And it's overwhelming. And those feelings are true, but they rarely tell the whole truth, do they? That there's things happening before the problem and things that are supposed to happen after the problem that we often don't think about or consider. But Spirit of the living God, we know that if we listen to you and give our problem over to you, you will put it on the wood shop table and subject it to a process that fulfills a promise, just like Micah and Isaiah prophesied about you, Jesus, 700 years before you showed up on the scene. So I don't know how many cuts you have to make in the raw material of our lives, God, before you create a finished product, but we just say, whatever you want to do and however long you want to take, we give you permission to do so. So may God's people at this local church, in this state, in this city, believe in an almighty, all-knowing, all-loving God who doesn't see the problems of our lives the way that we do, but instead sees his unfinished plans. May we have the courage of Joseph to listen to what you're saying to us this morning. Speak to us in Jesus' name.